News. News of the hour on the hour from American Information Radio. This is George Engelman of this hour. The Apollo astronauts and the Soyuz cosmonauts are on their own again. After two days of sharing food, friendship, and international fame, the spacemen undocked their ships a little while ago and drifted apart. At the time of separation, Soyuz Commander Alexei Leonov said, Mission accomplished. The Apollo Commander, Tom Stafford, called out, Good show. The fly arounds of the uh, Soyuz spacecraft, uh, these maneuvers in connection with uh, a joint experiment. And uh, our Russian linguist, Harry Walsh, was also uh, monitoring a news briefing at the Moscow Control Center. Harry? Uh, David, the number of questions were asked at the news briefing in Moscow just a few min moments ago, and some things were cleared up. Uh, one <coughs> correspondent uh, asked why the uh, backup crew of the second Soyuz rocket uh, waited until yesterday or day before yesterday to uh, to leave Baikonur and it was stated at the time that Ulkovishnikov and Filipchenko, the backup crew, uh, remained with the ship until the successful docking t took place. Their original goals were to be launched in case the Apollo flight had to be delayed four days or if the docking did not go well with the first Soyuz. There was also, David, a question with regard to the coverage of the Soviet uh, landing on Monday in Kazakhstan. It was stated uh, there at the press conference that the coverage would be on television by helicopters in the area and that the image would be transferred to ground antennas and then through the communication satellites to ground stations throughout the world. Relayed live once again, and I believe that's going to be another first for the Soviet people. Yes, indeed, David. And uh, we also have something here that uh, might be worthy of, of mention. A notice, a notice was posted here not long ago on the News Center bulletin board. Uh, we're not real sure where it came from. It is in two languages, and perhaps, Harry, if you would like to read that in Russian, and then I will read it in English. Well, the Russian says, Внимание журналиста! В воскресенье в три часа дня на поле за телом Холодея Ин, дорога НАСА-1, состоится футболный матч между представителями ЦРУ и КГБ, находящимися здесь как аккредитированные представители прессы. Комитет. David, I'm sure you know what that means. Well, uh... I will simply translate this because I have the English version that was posted in the News Center bulletin board. It says, notice to newsmen, there will be a soccer game at 3 p.m. Sunday at the field behind the Holiday Inn on NASA Road 1 between representatives of the CIA and the KGB who are here as accredited media members. Signed, the committee. Which side will you be playing on, David? I haven't made up my mind yet. I agree. Either. All right. This is David Crane with Harry Walsh at the Johnson Space Center. There the Apollo spacecraft undocked from Soyuz this morning, and then Soyuz docked with the U.S. spacecraft to test the Russian docking equipment. Both the maneuvers worked beautifully. Then later on, the Apollo pulled away from Soyuz, ending the first meeting of two nations in space. Keep it informed leaves next Saturday for 35 Nation Summit in Helsinki. I'm Bernard Shaw reporting on the CBS Radio Network. Last time today, ending two days of experiments. Soviet Commander Alexei Leonov called the two days only the beginning of a great human journey into outer space. The Soyuz returns to Earth Monday, and the Apollo astronauts will splash down Thursday. CBS News continues in a moment. Six o'clock. CBS News. After two days of working in space as one unit, the American Apollo and Soviet Soyuz spacecraft are now moving away from each other. I'm Jim Kilpatrick reporting on the CBS radio network. The latest from Nelson Button at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. The separated Russian and American spacecraft are moving farther apart with each orbit of the Earth after their near-perfect two days of flight joined one to the other. Apollo and Soyuz are a little over 16 miles apart now, flying west to east over Newfoundland. Soyuz coasting for a Monday landing in Siberia, Apollo staying aloft until its Thursday splashdown near Hawaii. 
The two crews bade each other farewell this morning due east of Cuba over the Atlantic. Both crews have several onboard experiments to complete before they land. Apollos, Stafford, Slayton, and Brand have a broader range of such efforts with their longer mission. Flight operations officers said it is conceivable that Apollo's crew might be able to actually observe the Soyuz when it lands on Monday with the aid of onboard optical devices. The two spacecraft will be something over 200 miles apart when Soyuz touches down. Nelson Benton, CBS News, Johnson Space Center. Oh, the Soviets will splash down Monday, and the astronauts will wait until Thursday to return. So by next week, the space travelers will look back at two years of work preparing for the mission. Looking back at those two years was one of the astronauts' wives, Mrs. Vance Brand. It really hasn't been too much different than the seven years before that, because Vance was on backup crews and support crews, and he spent a lot of time away from home. The only thing that was different that he spent quite a bit of time at home learning Russian that he, of course, had not been doing before. As you know, KTRH has been providing you with extensive coverage of the joint spaceflight. KTRH reporter David Crane has been assisted by linguist Dr. Harry Walsh in providing uh, you with up-to-date information. Actually, our KTRH reporters are only two of a small army of reporters from all over the world, including, of course, the Soviet Union. And any time you get that many people together, there's bound to be some offbeat kind of stuff. And today, a typewritten note in English and Russian appeared today in the news center at the Johnson, uh, at the Johnson Space Center. The U.S. control point, that's what, the U.S. control point for the Apollo-Soyuz International flight. And the note said this, quoting now, Notice to newsmen, there will be a soccer game at 3 o'clock at the field behind the Holiday Inn on NASA Road 1 between representatives of the CIA and the KGB who are here as accredited media representatives. The note was signed to committee. Soviet news representatives roared with laughter when they saw the note. A U.S. expert on Soviet affairs said the Russians appreciated the humor of the note because they... News of the hour on the hour from American Information Radio. This is Charles Webster, and at this hour... Soyuz are drifting apart following a short rocket burn by the Apollo craft this afternoon. The two uh, uh, spacecraft unlinked for the final time this morning. Soyuz is scheduled to make a soft landing Monday in Soviet Central Asia. Apollo will remain in orbit until Thursday. President... ...craft are flying separately tonight. The historic link-up of the two ships ended earlier today. They undocked, and the Apollo's rocket engine was fired to take the ship into a different orbit. The maneuver ended two days of the link-up and joined experiments by the three American astronauts and the two Soviet cosmonauts. The Russian ship is due to land on Monday. The Apollo ship stays up until Thursday. American Information Radio. This is Don Fisher, and at this hour, the spacecraft continue to orbit the Earth, but now miles apart after undocking during the day and ending their historic link up in space. In Houston, flight director Pete Frank told reporters about his latest talk with a Soviet counterpart. I did have kind of a, a discussion with my counterpart about splashdown parties. Uh, you know, it's the custom here to to have a splashdown party, but we couldn't decide about uh, Moscow because their spacecraft didn't land in the water. So uh, we decided they'd have a thump-down party. That's Apollo Flight Director Pete Frank. The cosmonauts will thump down Monday in Central Asia. The astronauts will splash down to the Pacific on Thursday. The 9 o'clock. <laughs> CBS News, postal contract talks are scheduled to resume at this hour amid optimism that agreement is near. Good morning, I'm Neil Strasser reporting on the CBS radio network. As crews go their separate ways today, Soviet space officials in Moscow say there were a few moments of concern yesterday during the second docking of the two spacecraft. The Apollo spacecraft began to pitch and put considerable strain 
on the Soyuz docking mechanism, the official say, however, that there was no great danger. The cosmonauts return to Earth tomorrow morning. The astronauts stay up until Thursday. Neil Strasser, CBS News. News of the hour, on the hour, from American Information Radio. This is George Caldwell, and at this hour... There was some difficulty yesterday in the second docking operation between Soyuz and Apollo. American technicians had said the docking went perfectly. But the Soviets say just after the docking, the two ships started to move unexpectedly, straining the Soyuz docking mechanism severely. The Soviets say even if the mechanism had broken, the cosmonauts would not have been endangered because their hatch was closed. The Soviets say they don't know what caused the problem. Flight Director Don Putty just concluded a change of uh, a chef briefing a few moments ago, indicating that all continues to go well aboard the Apollo uh, spacecraft. He says uh, they're keeping the crew, uh, Tom Stafford, Deke Slayton, Vance Brand, extremely busy, and they will be during these last few days, uh, with experiments. Uh, the emphasis on experiments uh, in solar, the atmosphere around Earth, and Earth itself. The Earth are resources experiments they're carrying, very similar to those aboard a Skylab in studying Earth's natural resources. Uh, much of the emphasis being placed on the experiments yesterday afternoon uh, during a science briefing here, and again today, is in the response to a statement by uh, a United States Senator, uh, William Foxmeyer, uh, who has long been critical of this mission. Uh, he said uh, yesterday morning that uh, this mission meant nothing as far as science concerned, and the immediate response was from uh, the scientists here and some 17 principal investigators who originated uh, many of these experiments, uh, contacted NASA here from around the world and said, how can we call because we have experiments on there that we'd like the senator to know about. Uh, the Soyuz spacecraft, uh, Harry, uh, all continues to go well there from what I understand. Yes, David, the uh, retro rocket of the Soyuz was tested earlier today and uh, also they, it underwent a routine pressure integrity check and seems to be in proper working order for tomorrow's uh, put down. And that put down or touch down or bump down, uh, whatever you want to call it, is scheduled to take place at about 5.51 in the morning. You'll hear it live right here on KTRH. This is David Crane with Harry Walsh at the Johnson Space Center. Meanwhile, Mrs. Vance Brand was asked by Crane if she and her husband had ever discussed the political impact of the Apollo-Soyuz mission. I think we realized how important it is to Europeans to try and work together. More than in this country where you can travel for thousands and thousands of miles and you never leave the United States. But there, you travel such short distances and you can go through two and three countries. And I feel the significance of this trying to work together and of accomplishing something together that perhaps will be more important than even going to the moon has been. That's Mrs. Vance Brand. Time on the KTR Richmond Day Report is 12.10. CBS News. Postal negotiations still underway in an attempt to avert a postage strike tomorrow. This is George Herman reporting on the CBS radio network. From American Information Radio. Well, you spacecraft continues to increase. The Soviet cosmonauts spent most of the day taking care of some house cleaning in advance of their return to Earth tomorrow. The Apollo astronauts flashed down in the Pacific Thursday. Now, 5 o'clock. CBS News. Negotiations continue in Washington in an effort to settle contract differences affecting more than a half million postal workers. I'm Dan Rather, reporting on the CBS Radio Network. Peanut. CBS News. Negotiations aimed at bringing about agreement on a new contract for postal unions are still going on with no agreement yet. I'm Gary Shepard, reporting on the CBS Radio Network. <laughs> On the hour, from American Information Radio, this is Bob Gibson, and at this hour...
service and 600,000 postal workers. I'm Ann Crosman reporting on the CBS radio network. Astronauts are sleeping now, but in a few hours they'll be awakened to make final preparations to return to Earth. For the first time, Soviet television will broadcast a spacecraft landing live. It's scheduled to take place about 7 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time. The Soyuz spacecraft will be getting ready soon to return to Earth. They're scheduled to parachute down in Central Asia about 7 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time. Soviet television will carry the landing live for the first time ever. A partner, Werner von Braun, says that rocket fuel may provide a clean-burning substitute for gasoline in automobiles of the future. Von Braun told the West German news magazine Der Spiegel that the ideal automobile fuel would be pure hydrogen, which gives off pure steam and not polluting exhaust fumes. Von Braun acknowledged that hydrogen was hard to handle, but he did say that Mercedes-Benz has succeeded in building a transportable tank for hydrogen to power experimental autos. I'm Ann Crosman, CBS News. CBS News. The contract for 600,000 postal workers has now expired as talks on a new contract continue in Washington. I'm Ann Crosman reporting on the CBS radio network. Soyuz return to Earth Monday will be televised live, a first in Soviet space history. The two cosmonauts are scheduled to parachute down in the Central Asian heat belt at 6.51 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. All systems on board the Soviet space shift are reported normal. The American astronauts who have been busy running experiments and separating from Soyuz on Saturday will splash down Thursday in the Pacific. Up the hour on the hour from American Information Radio. This is Don Fisher, and at this hour, folks. Agreement has been reached in the postal contract talks as negotiators for the Postal Service and four postal unions are talking right through the strike. Preparing to give a long farewell to space. The end of the three hours, they'll fire retro rockets to slow their re-entry capsule and begin the descent to work. They're scheduled to soft land about 300 miles from the Baikonur Cosmodrome unless they were blasted into orbit last Tuesday. For the first time, the plan to be carried live by Soviet national food plan in America. One hour and ten minutes and counting aboard Soyuz and at Russia's Star City Space Center until retrofire and the start of the cosmonauts' return to Earth. Good morning, I'm Mike Stanley reporting on the CBS radio network. The cosmonauts will trigger the Soyuz braking rockets in a two and a half minute burn, slowing their spacecraft. Twenty minutes later, they'll separate their descent module from its orbital module, and in another four minutes, will be touching the fringes of Earth's atmosphere. At 6.50 Eastern Daylight Time, they're scheduled to land in the Russian East Asia Food Belt region. Tiny breaking rockets fire automatically when the spacecraft is stand 10 feet from the ground, and providing what is programmed to be a soft landing. For the first time, Soviet media will provide live coverage of the landing, and the world will be able to see just how the Russians manage it. Good morning, Pam. And that bump down is scheduled for less than two hours from now. And uh, Harry, I understand all is going well as we're, we're listening to Moscow Mission Control at this moment. Yes, the, um, the crew of the Soyuz 19 is just going over with the ground control certain procedures involved in dumping some of the pressurization out of the orbital module, which is routine for the reentry phase of the mission. And uh, they're going over the various procedures, and they're in the 95th orbit coming up. The next orbit will be the last orbit. And we got an indication today that the cosmonauts were advised to take uh, some more medicine of some type? Uh, there's a mild sedative, which they say is routine on the uh, on reentry. And it's perfectly understandable, I think. Uh, considering uh, the manner in which they land and the difficulties they had in the past, I imagine it is. Uh, by the way, the Apollo...
Morning, Bob Jr. How are you this morning? Fine. And we're coming up now on the uh, Suez de Orbit burn. Harry Walsh translating for us. The burn has begun. And I think the last... I think he said 47 seconds into the burn. We understand, Sayus. Moscow Mission Control reported just a moment ago that the originally scheduled landing site will be about 100 miles. 40 seconds to go. He's right now there are approximately 30 seconds to go in the burn. Very similar procedures will follow uh, next Thursday afternoon for the Apollo splashdown. Understand, 90. And the Soyuz uh, touches down. Two minutes. Two minutes into the burn, all is normal. to be an on-time burn as scheduled. Moscow control should confirm that within the next... Uh, it should be ending right about now, David. <laughs> Working normally. Over. Who is doing most of the communicating there? Is that uh, not there? Kubasov, I believe. Uh, Kubasov, mm -hmm. the flight engineer. Right. Kubasov uh, communicating with Georg Shonyan, who is this year's uh, Cap Capcom in the uh, Kaliningrad Center, the Mission Control Center outside Moscow. Well, David, the burn is, uh, if it's going according to schedule, and it's supposed to be 105.6 seconds, then it is completed at this time. We haven't received an announcement other than everything, seems, everything is functioning normally what seems to be their word for okay in the way of uh, everything is proceeding on schedule as planned. If you may give us an idea of what happens next with the Soyuz uh, spacecraft. Well, David, in a very few minutes, approximately uh, six minutes, the descent module will become separated from the orbital module in front of it and the uh, instrument module behind it and will begin its uh, re-entry into Earth and uh, we expect to in about another 30 minutes, 35 minutes, it should be on the ground. Very good, Harry. Thank you very much. Once again, the Soyuz spacecraft has performed a successful deorbit burn, and uh, we'll be back up alive to bring you the Soyuz touchdown in the Soviet Union. This is David Crane with Harry Walsh at the Johnson Space Center. Yes, thank you, Dewey, and with me, Harry Walsh, our translator. And Harry, all appears to be going well. On our uh, screens here at the Johnson Space Center, we're getting a, a magnificent view from the Kazakhstan area. 
of the Soyuz spacecraft descending. Yeah, we were told uh, recently it was 2,000. Uh, 600 meters altitude, descending what seems to be rather rapidly at the present time, so it should be down, it's scheduled to be down in something in the order of four minutes, may hit down before that time. And the voice we hear there, I believe, is Moscow Mission Control. That's right. It looks like there's a great deal of lateral movement uh, involved in the descent. There's only a single parachute, unlike the Apollo, which has three. Um, and of course, we're touching down. There is going to be a. Uh, the, they record their landings according to the uh, international FIA sports uh, record. So there will be somebody on the ground to record the flight, the length of the flight, the place, and so forth. To, uh, the announcement was about that. And the picture we were receiving now here at the Johnson Space Center is coming from uh, uh, aircraft uh, in the area, Soviet aircraft. Again, this is the first uh, uh, live uh, broadcast of a Russian landing of a spacecraft. So we're not getting a very good, very good image on our monitors, David. I gather this is being taken from helicopter. 1,400 meters still. It must be descending quite slowly. It seems to be going laterally more than down. To get on their touchdown, they use uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 18 tiny rockets in the bottom of the uh, Soyuz uh, lander, which are fired at uh, just a few kilometers. 74 meters a second is the descent rate. There. It's a thousand meters in height now. 47 minutes after the hour. And it looks like they're going to be right on time. Yeah. The ready, being made ready for the contact to the ground. The rockets will be fired, will be fired evidently automatically rather than manually. There's an automatic altimeter which begins the uh, firing of the small retro rockets that they had at about six feet. The video tape that we've seen of um, another Soyuz landing indicates that indeed it is a very gentle landing here. Yeah, it's very, very slow descent. Just hope there are no lakes around. Yeah. <laughs> Although we should mention that uh, they are prepared if they should happen to uh, descend for a water landing. They are prepared for that. They cross my off and then and the rescue teams. Their rescue procedure is very, very similar to ours. They use of helicopters, but doctors nearby. Parachute has been cut away from the craft. 
drift free so it won't tangle it and pull it along if in the case there's any wind. A huge cloud of uh, smoke. There are helicopters descending in the area, and the search helicopter, which is right on the spot, is coming down now. There are several of them. They will have on board uh, uh, positions, and uh, they will have individuals to take the equipment out of the capsule, and they will have a number of other individuals there to make sure everything is all right. And the video that we receive here now shows the spacecraft down and apparently in good shape. Still no word from the cosmonaut. The helicopter is down. 52 minutes after the hour. The landing has landed. The helicopter is landing here. The descent vehicle. The landing reception group is moving towards the apparatus on the ground at the present time. They're moving quite slowly. Moving, uh, so apparently everything is all right. right. Still no word from the crew. We did get some communication from the, or we could hear some sort of weak voice communication coming from the capsule as it came down, David. It just wasn't intelligible. The ground crew is now around the lander. Uh, the Moscow time, 1.53. Everything exactly on schedule, on time. The uh, location of the capsule is very close to the journalist helicopter. Only Soviet journalists uh, are there at this time. No uh, members of the Western media were uh, permitted to, to the... I think we should have, uh, we should have, Leonis and Kubasa should be coming out of the capsule. They should take off their pressure suits. They should probably be taking their pressure suits off right now. The normal procedure is to change, uh, David, to remove the pressure suits on landing and change into the normal uh, constant wear garments, which they wear when not under, under uh, pressure conditions. This particular section of Kazakhstan appears to be... Uh uh, it's desert, obviously. There's very little growth there. And uh, very sparsely populated. Right. Yes, very much so. Uh, one reason for the touchdown instead of the splashdown is that they have given, uh, well, there's basically two reasons, I believe, Harry. One, uh, they have a uh, just come out of the Moscow time 154. There we can see Leonis now. He's still in his pressure suit, David. Still in the suit, and the applause you heard was from Moscow Mission Control Center. By the way, our astronauts are still asleep. They are not scheduled for awakening until 6.05. And Harry, I believe we can uh, definitely confirm now that everything has gone well with this The health of the cosmonauts is fine. It all appears to be going well at this stage. Once again, the next event in this mission will be Thursday afternoon with the landing of the Apollo spacecraft. This is David Crane with Harry Walsh at the Johnson Space Center. The site took care of the flaws, and uh, we're told that uh, the men were just a little bit shaky as they got out of that spacecraft, and we were assured that they would be readjusted to Earth's gravity very quickly. All seems fine here. Clock has stopped. Well, at least we've made it halfway through as far as the safety factors are concerned, and of course our concern now will turn to the, to the mission of our uh, remaining half, the United States portion of it, and I believe uh, before 
Many more weeks go by. All of those men will be reunited in some Moscow ceremonies and celebrations. Leonov had said one time that they had opened or partially opened a bottle of some liquid to celebrate with and had vowed they'd finish it someday when the mission was over. I suppose uh, that is yet to come after the Apollo men get down. Indeed, a large half-finished bottle there. We're told the crew is happily answering questions. We don't know what questions they're being asked or, uh, or what questions they're answering. But uh, everything seems so smooth. They're being, uh, being kissed by some of the rescue workers there. And uh, it's an emotional welcoming back to Earth. I wonder then uh, how soon uh, the plan calls for them to be returned to, to uh, the capital there. You know, as far as, as far as we know, Reed, uh, they'll be flown back to uh, Star City, Yosni Gorodok, which is about uh, 25 miles away from Moscow, the Cosmonaut Training Center, on Wednesday. And uh, they're going to come and meet reporters in Moscow on Thursday, the day of Apollo splashdown. So that will, uh, I hope, not conflict with what's going on as far as the splashdown uh, of Apollo is concerned. It's going to be an interesting, uh, an interesting rejoinder at some uh, nearer meridian than they uh, have met at up there in space. And I believe, uh, Richard, we have written some history here that uh, may well cast a shadow ahead. I should imagine that the Soviet interest in uh, watching things as they happen rather than being told about things after they have happened will, uh, will be catching, will be habit-forming, and perhaps uh, they'll be seeing more of this and hearing more of this as it happens. Certainly the official confidence in, uh, in, in providing such events live should be uh, improved. Certainly. Richard Roth, we must go. Thank you from Moscow. This has been the uh, continuing coverage of Apollo Soyuz, a meeting in space. I'm Reed Collins, CBS News Space Headquarters, New York. CBS News. The Soviet cosmonauts are down to Earth. They landed safely, right according to plan, in the prairie of Central Asia just nine minutes ago. Good morning. I'm Charles Osgood reporting on the CBS radio network. Our Apollo astronauts will stay in orbit for three more days, but the Soviet cosmonauts are finished with their part of the Apollo Soyuz mission. Richard Roth is standing by to report in Moscow. Richard? A two and a half minute rocket burn dropped the capsule out of orbit and into a fiery path through the upper stages of the Earth's atmosphere. Then a parachute landing in the Kazakhstan desert of Central Asia. A big red and white parachute dropping the men slowly to work. A brief burst of fire from the small braking rocket spilled into the heat shield of the Soyuz descent vehicle and a perfect touchdown. Just three and a half minutes later, the men stepped out. First, Sabasov, then Leonov kissing and embracing the rescue uh, workers and smiling, waving to television cameras and uh, speaking with reporters on the scene, being interviewed, saying they were happy and safe. The end of the Soyuz mission. Richard Roth, CBS News, Moscow. More news after this.
morning's news. Good morning. This is Dallas Thompson with the CBS World News Roundup. Mission Control in Houston this morning gave the Apollo astronauts the news that the Soyuz spacecraft had landed safely, and Thomas Stafford responded. We're just looking at the TV here and see that Soyuz has landed safely, and uh, Alexei and Vladdy uh, were outside of the spacecraft and seem to be in good health. Very good. Give us our best. Sure glad to hear everything. Good. That brief exchange came just after Soyuz hit the dust of Central Asia, and a landing reported now from the press room in Moscow by Richard Roth. After a fiery re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere, a big red and white striped parachute unfurled from the descent vehicle and carried the cosmonauts to an on-target landing in the desert. A cloud of dust as the ship touched down, and rescue workers were at its side in a minute. The hatch was sprung and the men climbed out. First, flight engineer Valeri Kubasov, and then pilot Alexei Leonov, smiling, waving, and embracing the ground crew. Leonov's first words to an interviewer, only now can we say that everything is all right. We feel shaky, he said, but it is from being happy as well as tired. First stop for the cosmonauts is the small city of Leninsk at the Baikonur Cosmodrome where the mission began six days ago. There will be medical checks, a debriefing, and a welcome ceremony. Then, on Wednesday, a flight to Moscow and a hero's reception in Red Square. Richard Roth, CBS News, Moscow. The Apollo spacecraft is scheduled to splash down in the Pacific on Thursday. You see AM and F it. News of the hour on the hour from American Information Radio. This is Bob Walker, and at this hour, it's one down and one still up in the historic Apollo Soyuz space mission. Correspondent Bill Larson reports from the Apollo Soyuz News Center. A wheat field in Russia was the center of the world's attention early this morning as Soviet cosmonauts Leonov and Kubasov touched down in a Soyuz spaceship after a flight of more than 142 hours. The cosmonauts fired small braking rockets on their spaceship just before touchdown, kicking up a plume of dust and dirt that made it look almost like a splashdown in the ocean. The cosmonauts posed for pictures for a few minutes, then were taken by helicopter to a nearby medical center for a checkup. Apollo astronauts Stafford, Slayton, and Brand sent their congratulations to the Soviet crew when they awoke this morning shortly after the Soyuz touchdown. The astronauts will spend three more days in space before splashing down in the Pacific Thursday afternoon. Bill Larson, ABC, Apollo Soyuz News Center. No postal strike. That story coming up. CBS News. African states claim France is landing troops on an Indian Ocean island. This is Reed Collins reporting on the CBS radio network. Well, not they're resting up now after a dusty landing on the Asian steppes four hours ago. The Soyuz drifted down on its single main parachute, fired retro rockets when a few feet from the surface, and rolled over on impact. Within minutes, however, the rescue crews had the hatch open and Kubasov tumbled out, followed by Leonov. Both men in good shape. Moscow says the Soyuz landed 6.2 miles from its intended target near the Kazakh town of Arkaluk. The American astronauts were asleep, and mission control did not awaken them for the Soyuz re-entry. But later, Thomas Stafford did receive the news, and he sent his congratulations. Cosmonauts successfully returned to Earth. We now have this update live report on the Apollo Soyuz test project from the Johnson Space Center here in Houston with KTRH News reporter David Crane and Dr. Harry Walsh. At 5.51 Central Daylight Time this morning, Soyuz 19 with Alexei Polyanov and Valery Kubasov successfully bumped down in the Kazakhstan area of south of uh, North Central Asia. The cosmonauts uh, left the spacecraft in just a few moments after touchdown and are now, uh, according to last word, in Tom, I believe, Harry. That's right, David. It's, uh, they should be there. I believe they're supposed to be brought into Moscow on Thursday. And Thursday morning, by the way, the cosmonauts will have a uh, public news session with the Western media. We'll be picking that up for their comments on their space flight on this historic mission. Meanwhile, the Apollo astronauts still have three and a half more days in space. They continue on with a series of experiments programmed into, the, into this mission, some 27 of them uh, in total. 
Their splashdown is scheduled for Thursday afternoon, some 350 miles west of Hawaii. This is David Crane with Harry Walsh at the Johnson Space Center. from American Information Radio. This is George Caldwell, and at this hour, 3 p.m. CBS News. As expected, President Ford has vetoed a bill rolling back prices on so-called new domestic oil to January levels. I'm Stephanie Shelton reporting on the CBS Radio Network. The project has been a mission of many firsts, and not the least of which is the establishment of the Soviet Space Public Affairs Office. I'm David Crane with Harry Walsh at the Johnson Space Center, back with details in just a moment. Each document from the Soviet Union outlining the basic objectives of this mission was a major breakthrough in itself in Soviet policy concerning their space program. They have also assigned a public information team here to the Johnson Space Center and in, uh, in Moscow. And Harry, I think for their first attempt uh, along these lines, it has been most credible. It has. We've uh, we met with, uh, with complete cooperation from uh, the Soviet representatives of the press and Soviet representatives on the mission staff here at uh, at the Mission Control Center. And uh, it's been a very amicable relationship. I have yet to hear of any uh, disagreements or harsh words between uh, representatives of the Soviet press and of the Soviet space program and officials of our journalists uh, here. One of the indications we have uh, received, and uh, perhaps understandably, is that the, uh, some of the Soviet technicians are uh, not used to questions from the Western media. Uh, well, I, uh, I think the reason for this, of course, is the fact that uh, very often uh, things that are newsworthy are things that uh, have a certain controversy value. And very often it is the controversial question which will be asked rather than uh, uh, questions designed to elicit information about the uh, technical nature of the, of the program itself. And I think uh, I've noticed both, both in the Moscow press conferences, which we picked up on the Soviet PAO system and in our own, we find uh, these type of questions which tend to be controversial or provocative being asked principally by the by American journalists whereas uh, foreign journalists tend to ask questions of a rather different nature, having to do with the mission itself. All in all, for their first attempt at setting up a public affairs office as such to aid the media in questions about uh, the Soviet space program, it's been a most credible effort. I'm David Crane with Harry Walsh at the Johnson Space Center. Yeah. CBS News. The battle is joined between President Ford and Congress on oil price control. I'm Stephanie Shelton, reporting on the CBS Radio Network. This is the World Tonight. Good evening, I'm Douglas Edwards, CBS News. Who remains in space until Thursday, but the Soyuz cosmonauts are back at the Baikonur Cosmodrome tonight, apparently in good health, obviously happy at their bullseye landing in a Soviet wheat field. Steve Young has more on the return of the Soyuz. The touchdown of Alexei Leonov and Valery Kubasov was the first recovery of the Soyuz spacecraft broadcast live on Russian TV. At a news conference afterwards, Soviet officials were reminded that they said a week ago the practice might be continued in the future if it vindicated itself. Today, they strongly implied that there may be more live coverage. The chief Russian cosmonaut seemed to suggest that when the two cosmonauts who have been aboard the Soyuz 4 space station for almost two months return in the next few days, that recovery operation will receive live coverage. The Russians impressed even Western newsmen today with the technical proficiency of their coverage, and they know it. Apollo command ships always land on water. We call it a splashdown. The Russian Soyuz always lands on land. And some American newsmen groping for a handy word nicknamed today's landing a thump down. The Russians said yes to that, protesting in mock anger that they don't call Apollo landings bubble down. Just call Soyuz landings landed or touchdown, they said. Steve Young, CBS News, Moscow. More news when the world tonight continues.
This is Don Fisher for American Information Radio with World Wrap-Up, the sounds of the news this July 21st, 1975. In the top of the news, a sharp increase in serious crime, President Ford vetoes oil bill, and another big grain sale for Russia. We'll have those and other stories in a moment. Dallas Townsend with the CBS World News Roundup. Thank you, Bill. Apollo astronauts Stafford, Brand, and Slayton will be awakened in about four minutes. They will continue their Earth orbit today by conducting a series of scientific experiments. Houston attorney Percy Foreman... American Information Radio. This is Bob Walker, and at this hour, our Stafford, Slayton, and Brand, who are due to return to Earth on Thursday, will spend most of this day conducting scientific experiments, including the behavior of fish in a weightless world. A Russian space scientist is predicting countries all over the world will, in the future, help track spaceships of other countries and carry out emergency rescues when necessary. The flight director for the Soyuz mission of Xi Yuzhnyev says the joint mission shows a good use of tracking stations in different countries for rescue work in space. CBS News. It's now President Sadat's turn to act on the UN peacekeeping force in the Sinai. I'm Richard C. Hartlett reporting on the CBS radio network. The Consumer Price Index jumps again in June to the highest level in six months. I'm Douglas Edwards, reporting on the CBS radio network. Brand and Slayton are continuing their Earth orbit today by conducting a series of scientific experiments. We have this special report now from the Johnson Space Center here in Houston with KTRH News reporter David Crane and Dr. Harry Walsh. As astronauts Tom Stafford, Dee Slayton, and Vance Brand were having their breakfast this morning, they received a, a summary of the news from Capsule Communicator uh, Carol Bobko, including this final item. And the last Oh, of our news this morning. The new development in underwear which may help to dispel domestic discord around the house. A firm has come out with deodorized underwear. The underwear is treated with a secret deodorant formula during the manufacturing process. The company says it continues to fight odor through 50 machine washings. The firm has a whole line of no-smell items for men, including socks, shorts, and t-shirts. But at this point, there is no such line for women. Sorry, we can't get any of that underwear up to you guys right now. That's it. That was a good news broadcast. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. You're welcome. We can't find any better to read up to you. Carol Bobko with a summary of the news and some comments by the astronauts, and I believe that was Vance Brand, Harry, asking, is that all? Yes, that's right. Vance having a hard time uh, figuring out which language you use up there, I believe. <laughs> and also commenting upon the fact, Deke Slayton there saying, uh, gee, it sounds good, we haven't had a shower in seven days, referring, obviously, to the new brand of underwear that's just now on the market. Meanwhile, it's another busy day for the astronauts. Uh, Flight Director Don Putty had indicated earlier today that the crew is spending some 15 to 17 hours a day working on various experiments, including Earth observations. And the Earth observations uh, passes are being directed here by a professor from the Smithsonian Institute, uh, Dr. Farouk El Baz. And I was talking with uh, Dr. El Baz a short while ago and asked him about a comment made by Senator William Proxmire, a critic of, of this particular mission. Uh, Senator Proxmire indicated that this mission held absolutely no uh, scientific uh, emissions whatsoever, and uh, Dr. El Baz disagreed. To agree with the uh, Senator, I think it was a sad uh, statement, uh, and uh, I, uh, I really think that if the Senator was uh, familiar with the scientific package on ASTP, he would not have uh, said so. It is uh, true that the uh, political part or the political aspect of uh, ASCP is uh, the one that was uh, more uh, dramatic.
dramatic and uh, uh, everyone is uh, quite familiar with it, but uh, NASA has tried to put together a reasonable scientific package on ASTP and I think there are some very fine experiments uh, on board, so the mission also has scientific value. I cannot say that the mission does not have political and other uh, values, but the uh, mission, we should say, that has also a very good scientific value. Dr. El of the Smithsonian Institute, uh, heading up the principal investigation team here, looking at Earth resources, Earth observations. Uh, meanwhile, all continues to go well aboard the Apollo spacecraft. They will continue with uh, their scientific experiments and still looking for a Thursday afternoon splashdown some 350 miles west of Hawaii. This is David Crane with Harry Walsh at the Johnson Space Center. The dot speaking in Cairo says he has not yet made up his mind about the United Nations Security Council request that he reconsider his refusal to renew the Sinai Peacekeeping Force mandate. I'm Stephanie Shelton reporting on the CBS Radio Network. Slate and Advance Brand will hold a news conference tomorrow morning at 7.30. And for the first time, members of the media will be permitted to pose their questions directly to the astronauts. In the past, the media submitted a list of questions, which were then read up to the astronauts by the capsule communicator in the Mission Operations Control Room. Due to a lack of space there, the conference will be conducted from the Johnson Space Center Auditorium via microphones connected to the communication system in the Mission Operations Control Room. This is David Crane at the Johnson Space Center for KTRH News. This is the world tonight. Good evening, I'm Douglas Edwards, CBS News. <laughs> the hour on the hour from american information radio this is bob gibson and at this hour Apollo astronauts are encountering problems in trying to perform some of their aerial observations a report from correspondent vic ratner at the apollo soyuz news center bad weather on the ground continues to foil most of the apollo crew's efforts to spot ocean currents and geological land patterns the crew did see some icebergs in the north atlantic but not much more than that Astronaut Deke Slayton was not even able to see his home state of Wisconsin as he passed over it. Another problem today was a leak which ruined an experiment designed to separate blood cells in zero-G, an experiment that medical men had hoped would make it easier to cure blood diseases. Vic Ratner, ABC News, Apollo Soyuz News Center. Submit to the crew of Apollo. They hold a news conference with questions radioed from the ground conduct a series of final experiments and prepare for splashdown Thursday in the Pacific. More CBS News coming up. Good morning. This is Dallas Townsend for the CBS World News Roundup. And reporters on the ground is the main feature of the Apollo schedule today, its last full day in space. Nelson Benton reports from the Johnson Space Center. A while after their news conference from aboard the spacecraft, astronauts Stafford, Rand, and Slayton will begin trimming down the Apollo for its landing tomorrow. At mid-afternoon, the docking module, through which they met with Soyuz cosmonauts and flew joined together last week, will be jettisoned. Apollo will make whatever course adjustment necessary to assure that the drifting module does not interfere during the remaining day-and-a-half flight. As the crew and its controllers on the ground look to tomorrow's splashdown, NASA's weather information indicates suitable conditions in the Pacific near Hawaii, where the Apollo return is to take place. The spacecraft itself is performing just as it should, as the last flight of an Apollo spacecraft nears an end. Nelson Denton, CBS News, Johnson Space Center. Bill, Apollo astronauts Stafford, Brand, and Slayton will begin an in-flight news conference at 7.30 this morning, fielding questions from news reporters at the Johnson Space Center here in Houston. The conference will last for 30 minutes, and KTRH will have a live report at 8 o'clock from news reporter David Crane and Dr. Harry Walsh. The astronauts today will perform other experiments and then prepare for tomorrow's splashdown in the Pacific Ocean, scheduled for 418 Houston time in the afternoon. Another here. Soyuz 18 was launched into Earth orbit on May the 24th, and its crewmen have been carrying out a number of experiments in the Soyuz station, which is about half the size of the American Skylab, in which the Skylab 4 astronauts established the current space longevity record of 84 days. 
It has been common speculation that two months is the approximate length of time a crew can safely and conveniently inhabit the Salute Station. It will be recalled that Senator William Proxmire expressed the opinion recently that the Soviet space program was not sophisticated enough to maintain the Soyuz 18 and Soyuz 19 flights simultaneously. It was then announced in the Soviet Union that the Soyuz 4, Soyuz 18 mission was being controlled through the Equatoria tracking station located in the Crimea, while the Moscow Mission Control Center devoted its energies exclusively to the joint Apollo-Soyuz mission. Although the Russians are pursuing their usual policy of not announcing in advance the date of deorbiting for cosmonauts Timuk and Sivasyanov, it now seems quite likely that the Soviet Union will try for a mild propaganda coup by bringing down its second space vehicle in a week prior to the re-entry of the current Apollo flight on Thursday. This is Harry Walsh from the Johnson Space Center. Wednesday, July 23. That's the day, the date, in KTRH time. It's 8 o'clock. This portion of the KTRH morning report is brought to you by Farm. But here's Joe Coffer. Our Apollo astronauts have been holding a press conference. David Crane will be telling us something about it later on in this newscast. This will be the last full day in space for Stafford, Brand, and Slayton. Later on, the trio will begin preliminary preparations for their scheduled splashdown tomorrow. Good ship New Orleans is on station west of Honolulu to pick up the men. Tom Stafford, Steve Slayton, Vance Brand have just concluded a half-hour news conference this morning. And... Uh, for the first time, a long-standing NASA policy about the media asking questions directly of the astronauts was broken. We were given that opportunity. It went quite well for the most part. And uh, Tom Stafford was asked to comment on this, the end of an era, the end of Apollo, no more splashdowns. Uh, you know, it's been a, for me, it's been a great uh, number of years here. I enjoyed every bit of it. Uh, certainly, there's a lot of nostalgia in seeing Apollo, the end of Apollo. However, I think we are opening a new era with respect to the shuttle where space can have more utility, bring more benefits to man. It's going to be a quiet program for a couple of years, but uh, down the road, uh, things are going to be great, too, except it's just going to be a couple of years without some manned space flights. Over. And as far as that shuttle program is concerned, we've uh, learned that uh, director of the Johnson Space Center, Chris Kraft, has offered a job to Deke Slayton. There was some question about his future. The 51-year-old rookie astronaut will be given an opportunity to head up the test pilot program on space shuttle. This is David Crane at the Johnson Space Center. CBS News. Unsettled conditions in the Middle East brought a new statement of position today from Israel. This is Dallas Townsend reporting on the CBS radio network. Uh, still in orbit, held a news conference this morning with reporters on the ground. Nelson Benton has the story of the Johnson Space Center in Houston. Apollo astronauts talked with reporters in Houston by television link-up this morning, saying they think their flight with Russian cosmonauts was well worth the time, the trouble, and the money that it cost. Ahead now for the Apollo crew is the task of ditching in space the docking module which joined them to the Soyuz, and moving away from it. Tom Stafford said disposing of the tunnel should be no problem. I think all is going to see the docking module go. It's been a real friend to us. It uh, uses a bedroom, a transfer tunnel as an airlock, uh, an exercise room, and a few other things. The docking tunnel is to separate at mid-afternoon, leaving the crew with one full day in space before their rendezvous with a recovery force in the Pacific near Hawaii tomorrow. Nelson Benton, CBS News, Johnson Space Center. Clark. News of the hour on the hour from American Information Radio. This is Bob Walker, and at this hour... ...are preparing to cast off the docking module that connected their ship with the ship with the Soviet Soyuz last week. Its mission fulfilled, the module will be left behind when Apollo changes orbit this afternoon in preparation for splashdown tomorrow. On CBS News. Egypt agrees to extend the United Nations mandate in the Sinai, but only for three months. 
I'm Douglas Edwards, reporting on the CBS Radio Network. Most often by the rookie Apollo astronauts during this morning's in-flight news conference, for the first time, reporters and others were able to question the astronauts directly from Mission Control at the Johnson Space Center. Asked what he thought of his first trip to space, Vance Brand said it had been terrific. Uh, that's you know, the greatest experience I ever had. It's uh, just been super. Things up here uh, are uh, really thrilling. Started with the launch. Never forget that. And uh, seeing the Earth, seeing the Earth from uh, up here at this altitude, just a fantastic thing. The experiences of zero G, and of course. Uh, things in the mission uh, uh, have all been a lot of fun, and uh, that, that includes jockey, getting together with the Russians for two days, and everything else we've been doing ever since. It's uh, just been super. Former astronaut Alan Shepard asked Deke Slayton if the 16-year wait for his first mission was worth it. It feels great. The only thing that upsets me is that this all this fun for the last 16 years. You've known for that long how much fun it was. I'll have to sit back and listen to you guys talk about it. Never, it was quite as great as it really is. I don't think there's any way you can really express it at all. Well, no. I think Vance covered it pretty well. Everything from the liftoff up to this point has just been uh, super. And we know we have to come back tomorrow, and I'm not sure I'm looking forward to it. Slayton found out during this morning's news conference that he has a new job with NASA when he returns. There has been some question as to 51-year-old Deke Slayton's future with NASA. But that may have been answered now. The director of the Johnson Space Center, Dr. Christopher C. Kraft, has announced that Slayton will be offered the job of directing the horizontal test phase of the space shuttle program and will be considered as a space shuttle pilot. Slayton's response came during the crew news conference this morning, and as expected, it was positive. I'm looking forward to working on the shuttle or anything else that uh, NASA management wants me to do. And, of course, that's the uh, next program. I look forward to it as being a challenge. And uh, I like to fly anything and everything. And uh, if I get a chance to fly that duty, I'll sure be happy. The shuttle program, though, is not expected to be operational until 1979 or 80. David Crane, KTRH News. The Apollo astronauts are scheduled to splash down in the Pacific Ocean, 345 miles west of Honolulu, at 4.18 Houston time tomorrow afternoon. Live coverage will be provided from the Johnson Space Center here in Houston with KTRH News reporter David Crane and Dr. Harry Walsh. Returns to Earth... Down versus the Saiyu touchdown. Good reasons for both. I'm David Crane at the Johnson Space Center. Details in a moment. Inception, the Apollo spacecraft was intended to end its flight by splashing down in the water, as did the earlier Mercury and Gemini flights. The Saiyu, like its predecessors, the Rosshoff and Rosshoff missions, descend to Earth over dry land. There are several good reasons for the Soviet and the American methods of reentry. The Apollo was designed to return to the Earth's atmosphere from deep space at a far greater velocity than the strictly Earth orbital Soyuz, and to the greater speed of reentry encouraged a correspondingly softer landing procedure. Also, the Apollo Command Module weighs about 13,000 pounds, or as much as the Soyuz orbital descent and instrument modules combined. Therefore, the Apollo's chance of a soft landing on dry land are probably less than those of the Soyuz. There's much more water on the surface of the Earth than there is land, and thus an emergency landing, such as occurred during the Gemini 8 mission, is more likely to take place over water than land. And but lastly, the Apollo's primary mission was to go to the moon and return. And hence, a soft landing was desirable in order to avoid a hard landing capable of exposing the lunar samples to the Earth's atmosphere prior to the end of the quarantine period. The Soviet choice of dry landings for the Soyuz and for its predecessors in the Vostok and Vostok series is understandable for several reasons. The orbit reentry into Soviet territory provides protection of desire from foreign observation, and they have one-sixth of the Earth's landmass to choose from. 
And as far as we know, their landings have ranged from northern Kazakhstan to the lower course of the Volga River to the northern Urals region of Perm in the case of Vashov II when Alexei Leonov and Pavel Balyev had to bring their craft down manually following a failure in their automatic braking procedure. They landed far to the north of their intended landing site. The first Soviet cosmonauts had to be catapulted from the Vashov capsule following which they landed with the aid of individual parachutes. The two Vosop flights in 1964 and 65 probably landed with a proper thump. The Tsai use, as we saw on Monday, has small braking rockets used for slowing down the capsule during its last few feet of descent. In addition, the Tsai use comes to Earth suspended beneath a single large parachute, one of which malfunctioned during the re-entry of Tsai use 1, causing the death of Vladimir Komarov. On the other hand, the Apollo was slowed down with the help of three parachutes, one of which malfunctioned, but without serious consequences, during Apollo 15. The parachute systems of Apollo and Soyuz both slow their respective rates of descent to approximately 16 miles per hour, and that's less than that of U.S. Army paratroopers using the conventional service parachutes. Barring unforeseen circumstances, a Thursday's splashdown by the Apollo Command Module in the Pacific Ocean will probably one of the more pleasant experiences of this last Apollo crew, since future space missions and originally dry landings by the shuttle will be witnessing on Thursday the 31st and last splashdown and the last of the famous splashdown parties. Hereafter, people will have to celebrate at controlled glide descent parties. I'm David Crane at the Johnson Space Center. One o'clock at news time, and we'll be right back. Hang in there, won't you? News of the hour on the hour from American Information Radio. This is Bob Walker, and at this hour... Time. CBS News. Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin says Israel will not sign another interim agreement with Egypt without direct negotiation. I'm Douglas Edwards reporting on the CBS radio network. CBS News. Israel's Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin has issued a call for direct negotiation between his nation and Egypt to try to win another interim peace agreement. I'm Christopher Glenn, reporting on the CBS Radio Network. CBS News. The White House says President Ford has a new compromise formula for decontrolling oil prices. I'm Douglas Edwards, reporting on the CBS Radio Network. The mission is winding down this afternoon. They predicted that space flights would become routine in the coming age of the space shuttle rockets. At the Johnson Space Center, David Crane has a report. Astronauts Tom Stafford, Deke Slate, and Vance Brand continuing on with another long day of experiments, including one which is looking for gravitational hotspots on Earth. Comments that this mission has no scientific value has not set well with the astronauts who have been spending some 17 hours a day conducting experiments. Splashdown is still scheduled for 4.18 tomorrow afternoon, some 350 miles west of Hawaii. Meanwhile, still no word on when the Soviet salute crew will touch down. It had been rumored that the Soviets would return the two crewmen after two months in their space station to coincide with the Apollo splashdown. David Crane, KTRH News. American splashdown versus the Soyuz touchdown. Good reasons for both. I'm David Crane at the Johnson Space Center. Detail in a moment. From an option, the Apollo spacecraft was intended to end its flight by splashing down in the water, as did the earlier Mercury and Gemini flights. The Soyuz, like its predecessors, the Vossop and Vossop missions, descends to Earth over dry land. There are several good reasons for the Soviet and the American methods of reentry. The Apollo was designed to return to the Earth's atmosphere from deep space at a far greater velocity than the strictly Earth orbital Soyuz, hence the greater speed of reentry encouraged a correspondingly softer landing procedure. Also, the Apollo command module weighs about 13,000 pounds, or as much as the Soyuz orbital descent and instrument modules combined. Therefore, the Apollo's chance of a soft landing on dry land are probably less than those 
of the Soyuz. There's much more water on the surface of the Earth than there is land, and thus an emergency landing, such as occurred during the Gemini 8 mission, is more likely to take place over water than land. And uh, lastly, the Apollo's primary mission was to go to the moon and return. And hence, a soft landing was desirable in order to avoid a hard landing capable of exposing the lunar samples to the Earth's atmosphere prior to the end of the quarantine period. The Soviet choice of dry landings for the Soyuz and for its predecessors in the Vostok and Voskhod series is understandable for several reasons. The orbit reentry into Soviet territory provides protection of desire from foreign observation, and they have one sixth of the Earth's landmass to choose from. And as far as we know, their landings have ranged from northern Kazakhstan to the lower course of the Volga River to the northern Urals region of Perm, in the case of Voshov II, when Alexei Leonov and Pavel Valyev had to bring their craft down manually following a failure in their automatic braking procedure. They landed far to the north of their intended landing site. The first Soviet cosmonauts had to be catapulted from the Voshov capsule following which they landed with the aid of individual parachutes. The two Voshoff flights in 1964 and 65 probably landed with a proper thump. The Desai use, as we saw on Monday, had small braking rockets used for slowing down the capsule during its last few feet of descent. In addition, the Soyuz comes to Earth suspended beneath a single large parachute, one of which malfunctioned during the reentry of Soyuz 1, causing the death of Vladimir Komarov. On the other hand, the Apollo was slowed down with the help of three parachutes, one of which malfunctioned but without serious consequences during Apollo 15. The parachute systems of Apollo and Soyuz both slow their respective rates of descent to approximately 16 miles per hour, and that's less than that of U.S. Army paratroopers using the conventional service parachutes. Barring unforeseen circumstances, a Thursday's splashdown by the Apollo Command Module in the Pacific Ocean will probably be one of the more pleasant experiences of this last Apollo crew, since future space missions envision only dry landings by the shuttle will be witnessing on Thursday the 31st and last splashdown and the last of the famous splashdown parties. Hereafter, people will have to celebrate at controlled glide descent parties. I'm David Crane at the Johnson Space Center.